Hi, I'm David Penn, Research Analyst with Finnovate. Thank you for being with us here at Finnovate Fall 2021. And joining me is Trevor Marshall. He is the Chief Technology Officer with Current. Trevor, thanks for joining us today. Thanks very much for having me. Yeah, it's good to talk to you again. We've had the yes. opportunity to speak once or twice before in the yep. past, uh, electronically, digitally. Yep. So it's great to be here in the person with you. Yeah. Um, I thought for uh, folks who are just getting to know you, just getting to know Current, it might be nice if you just started off with telling us a little bit about yourself and the work you do at Current. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm the CTO of Current, and mm. I've actually been working with our CEO, Stuart, my whole career. Mm. So from right out of college, he hired me at Morgan Stanley, where I was doing some foreign exchange trading. Mm. And actually, what I was really excited about when I joined um, at the end of 2012 mm. was, oh, maybe I can bring Bitcoin to Wall Street, yeah. which was like this very you know, naive and um, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed <laughs> thought of like, oh, I can, I can do this thing. But luckily, even though I didn't make that happen in 2012, <laughs> 2013, or 2014, mm. um, I really kind of connected with Stuart on, on that level because foreign exchange is a decentralized asset class in the mm. sense of all of the trades are done between directly between counterparties or through sort of these custom created liquidity pools. Right. Um, and so there is this immediacy when you look at how um, Bitcoin and other uh, cryptos have evolved of the foreign exchange trader saying, I know exactly what this is. Mm. And for Stuart, who was 16 years doing this and actually saw the technology boom of foreign exchange, which yeah. was like a, one of the fastest um, digitized asset classes, right. um, immediately connected with it. Yeah. So um, after he left uh, Morgan Stanley, I followed him mm -hmm. and we did a couple of different projects some trading projects. But what we wanted to get to was the value network. So the thing that was underneath, you know, there's great value transfer businesses mm -hmm. available. And as traders, that's you know, the first place that we thought, but there's right. the, the, the value creation that's mm -hmm. possible by tapping into really the, the future of what's possible with mm -hmm. these networks is what we wanted to tap into for consumers. Right. So in 2015, after, you know, we'd spent a lot of time thinking about these ideas. So in 2015, we actually came together and, and formed Current, uh, mm -hmm. Finco Services Inc. This mm -hmm. is before we even kind of had a name um, and started building out prototypes and, and things in this direction. Mm -hmm. um, we started very on, like early on saying, okay, the, let's assume there is no banking backend. What is mm. what does that look like? And for us, that was actually building on top of Ripple in, in, yeah. the, in the early days. Okay. Um, and so storing balances onto you know via a trust line extended from a node that we would manage. It's very deep rip, Ripple stuff. But <laughs> what we realized is okay for consumers, that's that value isn't there yet. It will be, mm. but we have a business to build first. Right. Um, and that business is actually one of creating the technology that allows for those connections. Mm -hmm. So we know this is coming and finance 2.0 and whatever that looks like is certainly in the future and inevitable. Right. But we need to create this 1.5 world where mm -hmm. we have the technical infrastructure to handle the connections with the banks and the traditional products, mm -hmm. as well as the connections with these more open networks. Mm -hmm. and so that's been the driving force of what we've built, which from what we look like, because Current is, you know, a challenger bank by the right. so from the public perspective, it is a um, a debit card, it is an app, it is all of these things mm -hmm. that you know different ways you can look at it. And so from the outside, it looks a little bit different than really what's going on under the hood. Which is, you know, when we first started building things, like from an engineering perspective, that and we had defined that technology requirement, mm -hmm. we realized what we, we needed to do is manage our own core banking engine. And in mm -hmm. particular, we needed to manage our own ledger because that is the point of integration right. for a consumer experience, which is primarily a balance experience. Mm -hmm. And so we, by, by doing that, you know, there are many fantastic cores available, sure. but those are built by companies that are de designed to sell to many People, you need many right. customers to, mm -hmm. to sell to. And as a result, you get a more generalized, robust engine, mm -hmm. which is very conscious of the, you know, the different connections it needs to maintain in case the client wants to add a module for a savings account or add right. a mortgage product or add these other things which require that ledgering. We had the advantage of saying, we know exactly the experience we want to deliver mm. and we can design a, a sliver of that functionality so that from the app down to the data persistence layer, everything is consistent and it allows us to then move to any type of financial backend as yeah, we move sure. forward. 
So that resulted um, in our, we, we identified an early niche of our like teen, uh, you know, banking for teenagers and their parents. Mm -hmm. Said, okay, let's deploy this into that product. Mm -hmm. We can really test it out, um, uh, grow with it. We launched that publicly in 2017. Um, we made a lot of learning in, in public uh, on, on the technology layer and on the business and how, how all these things connected to that in uh, 2019, we could launch an individual product, um, you know, full DDA so you can receive um, pseudo DDA. You know, it's a virtual, <laughs> these are all software defined sure. concepts, um, which we define. Um, and so for the last two years, we've been in this construct of, okay, we have a stack that's delivering now to over 3 million users. Mm. Um, and we've been starting to kind of build out these bridges to these value networks, which was really, you know, seven years ago, the thing that we were super excited about. And I'm very happy to say, like, we're making tremendous progress there. Oh, fantastic, yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Now you're fresh off the stage from your uh, seven and seven presentation where yep. we had uh, some of our FinTech uh, analysts uh, go through some of their uh, top concerns, top issues that they had in seven minutes. And I wonder for those who didn't catch that session, if maybe you could share a top takeaway or two from that presentation. I, I think um, I talked a lot about sort of these ideas, mm -hmm. but in particular what I, I'm focused around is, it's actually something that, if you're familiar with the Akala team, Akala is a, mm. um, a, a team that's building in the Polkadot ecosystem, which oh, is a sure. delegated <laughs> proof of stake um, uh, layer mm. that a lot of interesting applications are being built on. Mm -hmm. um, but they kind of, uh, or Betty from, from their team, came up with this idea of hybrid finance or hi-fi, which is right. nice because you've got DeFi, but <laughs> hi-fi is really, how do you connect the consumer experience mm. and the applications that are accessible, convenient, distributable mm -hmm. to the value that's created on networks like Akala, like Compound, mm -hmm. like these other things which are extremely exciting but kind of hard to use, actually mm -hmm. very hard to use. Right. Um, and so really the takeaway is that the next layer, uh, in the next phase of what everyone's been paying attention to in, in DeFi is the distribution of DeFi. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be done by companies like Current mm -hmm. who, can, who can bridge those two things together because we have the technology to actually enable that in a seamless way. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have an advantage in the sense of we've been thinking towards this for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so the design decisions that we've made have kind of uh, unlocked this opportunity now. But you're going to see a big trend of other companies similar to us mm -hmm. who start getting into the distribution of, of these types of, of value networks. So that, I think was the, the main thing I hope people took away from that session. It's really interesting, and I maybe want to spend a little bit of, of time on that concept of hybrid finance. I'm sure it's one that folks uh, may have heard of, but might not be very familiar with. And I wonder if maybe we could just sort of pull that piece out yeah. and talk just specifically about what is hybrid finance and why you think it's such an important part of what's going on now. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think um, a good lens to look at it from is what are the values of each of these things? If we talk about traditional slash centralized, right. and then you know decentralized slash open right. networks. There, there are consumer value props to both. And mm -hmm. really the responsibility of Hi-Fi is to, to bring those together. So on, mm -hmm. on your cent traditional thing, you have security. And it's not necessarily the digital security, of which the open networks actually right. exist only because of. <laughs> it is the perceived security that mm -hmm. you have. So, you know, as you know, when you think of a bank, right. you go, oh, yeah, I put my money in a bank because it is safe, right? Mm -hmm. There's perceived security. And that's a, a, an extremely important um, value prop. You have this element of being certified. Right? Mm -hmm. So you have regulation, you have audit. These are other things that make um, you know, banks attractive because right. you say, oh, there's that FDSE logo. Mm -hmm. I know that there has been, even if you're as a consumer, you don't know the mechanics, you know that there's right. been some level of oversight that's been applied to this entity. Right. And there's also that convenience, right? Like I get a debit card, I can spend that anywhere. I don't need to go and ask, hey, do you accept this? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> can you show me your QR code for your Litecoin address, please? Because <laughs> that's all I have. Like, that's, so there's that convenience element. And then on the other side, you have the openness, right? You mm -hmm. have the accessibility. You have the ability to say, OK, I don't care what front end user interface I'm using. I'm ultimately pointing to a source of truth that is outside of the application layer. Right. You have the value. Because this is the first time that, in, for the first time probably in history, retail investors have more access than institutional mm -hmm. investors True, right. because mm -hmm. of uh, the way that you know, regulation applies to mm -hmm. institutional investors. But there's, there's tremendous value there through these different things. And whether that is through owning an NFT or staking Polkadot or funding a collateralized loan and, and making a return, mm -hmm. there's, there's just a tremendous amount of opportunity 
um, there. And really, when you combine those two things, it's, it's about, in hybrid finance, is taking those two value props, or six, or however many I said, <laughs> and, and bringing them together, which mm. is seamlessly delivering that value right. um, through a trusted entity. So like currents responsibility, and this is a little bit what we talked about in the fall mm. when we last spoke, which mm. is it's not no trust. Right. It's just less trust, mm -hmm. which is current still will bring you into this place and we will be a trusted participant where we can actually bring our consumers into this experience and they know that we can help manage that because we manage their money as mm -hmm. well. We manage their payments. They, we, we've already proven that we can serve our customers in a trustworthy way mm -hmm. and we can then bring them to that value in a way that prevents you know, the, the extreme technical understanding that's required to really interface and extract that value directly. Mm -hmm. And so hybrid finance is all about that connecting mm -hmm. and that, 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 that bridging, uh, which is really what we've wanted to do since the beginning. Right, right. It's a really interesting concept. One of the themes I think that I've, uh, I've picked up with some of the folks I've talked with, some of the more interesting conversations, really has a lot to do with that facilitation role. Yeah. That there are a lot of developments in different places. You've got your traditional developments on one side, and then some really incredible innovations on the other. And then you have either banks or fintechs that want to participate in that innovation, but crossing that chasm, uh, what they perceive to be a chasm, is really something that they are often are left on their own to do. Yeah. And to find out and to learn more about companies like Current that are really helping deal with that, recognizing that chasm is a real problem, trust issues, uh, just accessibility issues, just informational issues, and having entities in there in that middle who can say, okay, we're going to see the elements here, we see the elements here, we see the, the difficulties in making that transition, um, and we can help with that. I think it's a, it's a really interesting way of, of, of looking at a really interesting model for a company to, to, to have. I'm curious, we talked about a couple of different technology uh, things that are out there that are going on. I'm wondering in terms of some of the ones that you find most compelling, mm -hmm. some of the developments you find most interesting, um, and particularly as they relate to what Current's doing, uh, what would some of those things be? Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and I think one of the other things that is important to pull out of the hybrid finance idea mm -hmm. is really that it's not just crypto in terms of the decentralized. It is just other, the sort of moving towards a less directly connected and vertically integrated model mm -hmm. of business. Like one really good example, I think, is actually our cash deposits hmm. that we support on current, right? Nothing to do with crypto. Right. But what it, the way that we built it was there is a company called Incom. They have mm -hmm. you know, merchant distribution at tens of thousands of major brands across the country. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing is they're basically repositioning their distribution to make a direct facilitation of a payment onto our platform. Mm -hmm. And the way that we built it is actually with a direct relationship. There mm -hmm. is no other counterparty besides the people who are facilitating these deposits and current. And we can only do that because we maintain our own ledger and there are technologies like standardization. And standardization is, it's almost, it's, it's like language. It's the mechanism by which people understand how to communicate. Mm. And the evolution of that through open API specifications mm -hmm. allows you know, a developer on their end to quickly exchange information right. about how we need to communicate through the form of a schema that can be addressed over the internet in mm -hmm. a secure way. Mm -hmm. And even like that type of innovation is super important because it, go, it does go towards the more decentralized route of give people standard mechanisms of communication mm -hmm. and you will be able to build really interesting applications. And those standard, you know, by default in crypto, those come out of the box. Right. But you're also mm -hmm. seeing that type of approach come through big companies like Visa come through big companies like Incom and others, where they're taking this really API and standardized communication approach, mm -hmm. which allows for these more interesting integrations to be built. Yeah, very interesting. I'd like to look uh, back a little bit. I'm thinking of sort of the year that we've had, the pandemic, we were talking about it in, in terms of, of travel and people being able to come to conferences like this. I'm curious from a business perspective, how has the past year that we've had uh, coming up to, in some respects, the current times, yeah. uh, affected the work that you've been doing at Current? It, it's um, there's it's been a tremendous accelerating pressure, mm. um, and that's been you know good from a business perspective. Obviously, this is not a good time for most people. Sure. Um, but what it's done is it's put a lot of pressure on being able to deliver services in a digital way, mm -hmm. and in many ways, it's it's benefiting probably everyone who's at this conference right. and all, even even existing large institutions because what you're getting is a new type of engagement which is emerging through um, the requirements of, hey, maybe I don't need to physically be present right. at like a branch, or I don't need to be 
um, you know, there, there's certain things that I used to expect and that expectation created sort of my trust in the institution. Mm -hmm. And that has changed. And you see that sort of with the broader um, digital services trends where, you know, primary financial relationships being digital have gone from something like only 5% to something like 15% yeah. over like five years, right. which is an, an insane, like an insanely quick um, shift. Mm -hmm. um, so that's put a lot of pressure on us to be able to deliver things like customer service, mm. to be able to expand things like when stimulus payments came through, for example, right. One of the features that we have by operating our own core, processing our own ACH, is we see those files coming from the Fed. We're immediately crediting them to mm. customer accounts. Um, similar to like unemployment insurance, which has been coming through, similar to child tax credits, which is now um, right. starting to come through as well. Yeah. And so we're really on that edge of understanding like where policy meets technology. Mm. And 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 the the pandemic has really put a light on that, which is there are ways to get people access to money faster. There are ways to do things where you don't need to be physically present and still provide a great customer experience. And I think we're learning a lot from the last year. Yeah, so absolutely. Well. And it's really interesting the way that you, you, you mentioned the issues of, of policy. And I think about some of the policies that, that may have been acted and may have been um, uh, policies that were enjoyed, people liked them and so forth, but there were technical issues, there were administrative issues. And thinking about one of the interesting things, the way, the way that technology not only enables those policies to be more effective, but also maybe helps people understand the policies, appreciate them a little bit better, because they don't have some of the friction that gave them sort of the opportunity to start to question the policy when it was simply an administrative or simply a technical right. uh, challenge that was really keeping them from being able to benefit from what was maybe a very clear, very understandable and and obviously beneficial policy. So it, I think it's a really interesting point that you bring up. And it kind of leads me to my final question. Um, looking at this sort of nexus of policy, this nexus of uh, the policy and, and technology, where do you see the future of finance going from here, say over the next year or two, uh, thinking about some of these things that we've talked about? I, I think the most important trend where those two things in particular overlap is access. Mm -hmm. And it is the ability for everyday people to get access to the best possible outcomes. And really that is current's mission, which is to enable the best possible outcomes for our members. Mm -hmm. And the only way that you get to that is by building product, which delivers on the values that were previously guarded potentially mm -hmm. by either technological mm -hmm. hurdles because they were extremely high touch and not scalable, right or business model hurdles, which we're also overcoming with the way that we've, 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 we've built our, our, our product. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, those, that's probably the, the big thing. It's, it's that access. It's, it's making sure that everyone in, in this country and, and, and beyond right. has access to the best possible financial outcomes and the ability to improve their lives with the tools that they can get. Wow. That's a very good point and a very good point to, to, to leave with. Thank you very much for our conversation. It's really Thank excellent. You. I enjoyed very much your 7 and 7 presentation. Really nice to be able to follow up on some of those concepts here. I hope, hope able to, uh, people are able to benefit both from that conversation and, and this one as well. So fantastic talking with you again. Trevor Marshall, he is the Chief Technology Officer with Current. Thanks for joining us.